because they've been exporting those goods. Now we're actually competing or moving into an era where we are competing with a burgeoning or growing middle class in their own country who wants those same goods. And so essentially you're looking at a, at a bidding up in prices for those goods. That is correct. To put the numbers on, as you've mentioned, the consumption is about 72% of the U.S. economy. It's 38% of the Chinese economy. Now, other low-spending economies like Japan are notoriously low-spending economy, but it's 57%. Consumption is 57% of GDP in Japan. Even uh, undeveloped countries like India, you've got a number much closer to 60%, but China is 38%. So it gives you some idea how far behind they are. But it's not just this consumption thing. I want to make that absolutely clear. I've just spent a week on a train going through China trying to answer the second part of the question that Greenspan poses, which is, has the shift of the labor force from the command economy to the market economy, has it peaked and is it slowing down? And if that begins to happen, then Chinese workers begin to get greater pay rises. And this is a new structural change, not just a, a cyclical one. We're looking at higher levels of wage growth in China. And for a whole myriad of reasons, I came to a very strong conclusion that that is exactly what's happening in China. Uh, that the period of a massive, and it's one of the biggest mass, it's the biggest mass migration in history since uh, America, uh, the, the opening of the floodgates into America, right up until 1920. It's the biggest mass migration since then of Chinese people moving to the coast and building goods for export. That has really come to an end. So there's two parts of this equation going wrong for the West, if you like, simultaneously. Yes, we're competing with more middle-class purchasers in, in China. But secondly, that source of very cheap labor in China has come to an end because the massive reallocation of labor has come to an end. And the growth in the workforce is collapsing. That's not a great surprise to anybody, given the, the one-child policy in force since 1979. And you described that as a structural change. Does that have to do with the employment contract law? enacted in, in January of this year? There's a whole host of reasons why it's structural in nature. The first one is just simple, that if you sort of move people from the command economy to the market economy, one day you run out of people to move. Now, China hasn't run out, but the pace has slowed, so it's inevitable if you go through any structural change that it comes to an end. Uh, but you're right to mention the labor law. It's very important because the Chinese themselves, or the Chinese government, has made several key legislative changes in the last couple of years, which are really telling all of us what they want the economy to become. And one of those is that labor law, which is giving labor greater rights relative to capital, clearly increasing their bargaining power relative to capital, and clearly going to lead to a period where they get higher wages. A higher share of GDP will be with labor. Now, that's very good for consumption. It may not be good for corporate profit margins in the, in the short term, but it's very good for consumption. And I think it feeds into... You know, every Chinese leader has to have a buzz phrase to sort of characterize what he wants for his economy. And the buzz phrase of the current leadership is the harmonious society. And I think if you look at the policies they've introduced, this one, revaluing the currency, bank reform, the harmonious society is the consumer society. And that's a contentious thing to say, but I think that's where the harmonious society is, is leading us to. So the labor law is an important part of this. Uh, the best way to enfranchise a consumer is lend the money to buy things and give them a big pay rise. Well, across China, many people have got a 15% pay rise and if you, this year. And if you want to look at that in dollar terms, you're looking at nearly a 20% dollar pay rise plus your first ever credit card. It's a potent combination. It seems like the consumer society being launched there in China is something that here in the U.S. we just have no idea is happening. No idea is happening. And so you say, I mean, this is something that's becoming more obvious. You just spent time doing research in China. That's what you see on the ground. Absolutely. It's even coming through in the economic figures. The economic figures in China are notoriously unreliable. I think picking up consumption is particularly difficult because a lot of it's not measured properly. But all the figures that are picked up show that consumption is picking up at the expense of expensive exports. Remember that China is largely or partially still a command economy. And one of the advantages of a command economy is that it goes in the direction the government wants it to go. As we find out in the Soviet Union, it can be generations of misallocation of capital which show up eventually. Uh, but in the short term, it goes the direction the government wants it to go. And they clearly want it to go in consumption. The, the question your listeners really have to ask is, why did the Chinese spend 30 years devaluing their currency by 70 cent, 70% and then st suddenly start revaluing it if they really believe they're going to grow via exports? Why did they wait 30 years to reform the banking system? Remember, the Russians effectively obliterated their banking system within the first few years and started from zero. And why did they wait 30 years to give workers rights to get higher wages? There must be a good reason why the government is putting all these policies in place. 
there's several things crossing over. Go to China and you'll see it happening. Two, even the economic statistics are picking it up. And three, government policy is clearly pushing China in that direction. Just a reminder, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Today we're interviewing Russell Napier. And Russell, do you see the market economy in China overwhelming the command economy, overwhelming the government's ability to uh, place these uh, assets where they want? No, I, th- I think that's in the long term that must inevitably be where we get to, but we have to be very careful as to what the long term is. The core of any command economy is its banking system or financial system. Now, that is minority owned by foreign city bank own a portion, uh, Bank of America, I think, own a portion. Lots of uh, European banks own a portion, but they own minority interests in the Chinese banking system. As long as the Chinese government is the majority owner of its financial system, the, the misallocation of capital can't continue. So there are two very distinct parts of the economy here. There is the market economy. It's vibrant. It's healthy. It has the same degree of misallocation of capital, which any market economy has, and you're experiencing a little bit of that in America at the moment. But there is the other bit, which has got gross misallocation of capital, which is state-owned industries. They may be withering on the vine a bit, uh, but they're still there, and there'll be a significant portion of the Chinese economy for many, many years to come. So there's no doubt the command economy is growing quicker than the, uh, the market economy is growing quicker than the command economy will eventually prevail. Listeners shouldn't be expecting that to happen within one or two years. It'll be a much slower process. The key difference between China and Russia is that by utilizing their capital controls to control interest rates and the currency, they're producing a a slow process of reform, a more gradual process of reform, and a more gradual destruction of the command economy, which is great contrast to what happened across Eastern Europe. It's certainly, the skeptic might say, yes, but in Russia we saw different periods of glasnost and perestroika all throughout the 20th century, and each time they opened up their economy, allowed for capital flows to come in from the West, they essentially were using that to retool, bolster their economy, and then lo and behold, the command economy came back just as strong, if not stronger, revitalized with foreign capital. How would you argue that this is different? Somehow the market economy will, how would you argue that that this time it's different in China? Okay. What is reasonably clear in China is that the, the huge amount of foreign capital which is flowing in and the huge amount of private capital which is generated domestically, we should never forget in terms of the savings which are being reinvested, is really going into sort of one sector of the uh, economy, whereas the, the government finance is going into another. So in, in terms of splitting them out, is there any easy way to split them out? Well, not particularly, but if you think of heavy industry and everything else, uh, government funds are, are targeted towards heavy industry. They're not targeted towards retail. They're not targeted towards mobile telecommunications. They're not targeted towards other things like that. They tend to be targeted towards heavy industry. So it's not as if the um, the private capital is flooding in as yet to massively recapitalize the state-owned industries of China. As you know, China has a share class, a B share class, and an A share class. It's actually restricting the amount of capital it's raising for its state-owned industries to local owners rather than foreign owners. So there's always a risk, of course, that they just simply expropriate the entire market economy. Uh, but it's not as if we're bringing in foreign capital to, to retool the old state-owned industries and get them, them back on board again. But they, the risk of expropriation exists in any economy in the world, not just in China. I think it's worth stressing that China is definitely moving forward towards a market economy. I think if you believe that the, the harmonious society is a consumer society, uh, if you believe that the Chinese leadership is now concerned about uh, consumers or people, and um, we can't call them yet voters, then I think the move towards the market economy is, is angry, and any move away from that would meet with significant social disruption. Russell, do you see the free market banking system emerging in China like it did in America after 1919? Do you see those banks being national banks or, or free market banks, or do you see them from maybe the United States as where the loans are going to be coming from? Yeah, I think the way these things are being done is that foreign bankers are putting significant amounts of capital into Chinese banks. That capital is then largely segregated into a subsidiary which deals with specifically consumer finance. So, for for instance, the situation with the HSBC Bank of Communications deal is a lot of the capital which has come in is in a subsidiary. HSBC has an option at a time when it becomes a legally possible to buy a 50% stake in that subsidiary. So it's a complicated answer, but what's going to happen over the years is you're going to find that the old, badly run state-owned industry bank is going to own 50%. 